Good afternoon. Okay, so for my sins, I've been asked to give the landscape presentation on autonomous systems. That's being like being asked to dig up the United States with a spoon, I guess, in this time, this time frame, because this is a subject which is, is vast. As Keith has already said, it's very disruptive, and you can't help with the term autonomous systems bring to mind all the things you've read in the past 50 years, 60 years, 70 years of science fiction, dystopic, utopic, um, anthropomorphic um, representations of systems um, in society. So first of all, let's start off by saying, what's an autonomous system? If I say to you, a grandfather clock, is that an autonomous system in the context we're dealing here? You wind it up, you walk away, and it sits there and does its job. It has an analog model of time, which is actually quite clever, really. Um, is this what we're talking about? How about a nodding donkey? You all know what a nodding donkey is, I hope. If you've watched Dallas, a nodding donkey is the kind of pump you see in the background just nodding up and down. A pumping, pumping oil in the background is an autonomous system with some alteration of its behavior based on, um, based on sensors in the, in the pressure of the well, for instance. Okay, I suspect we're not really talking about that kind of system today. We're talking about the autonomous systems, which we can't help to think of robots, um, assistive elements, clever things on the internet, uh, Skynet, if you like, if you want to be a bit paranoid about the, about the whole thing. Okay. So let's start off by first of all asking, why are we wanting to do autonomous systems? What is it we're interested in about autonomous systems? One of the things we want to have is improved outcomes. Okay. <coughs> autonomous systems that can react faster than humans potentially can deliver improved outcomes. We already have very sophisticated autonomous systems running on the, on, on the web. These are things in financial trading systems. Systems that are autonomously trading on millisecond timings. And in fact, if any of you have been following the, uh, the front running scandal that's running at the moment in the city, this is another, yet another banking scandal about the, the way these systems are behaving, you know that this front running scandal is being run by autonomous systems. There are autonomous trading systems that have been set up to catch certain events on the, on, on, on the market and then front run in front of those events to take advantage of potential minor price differences in, in, in the market. It's completely legal, but it's being run by the, these computer systems at the moment. So one of the things is to have improved outcomes um, by having quicker reaction time, capability to integrate data um, faster, uh, more completely and more accurately. Another element we're looking for is efficiency. Uh, the, efficient, the word efficiency comes with some baggage, of course. Efficiency, efficiency for who? Efficiency to whose benefit, and sometimes efficiency at whose cost. Okay? In the example I'm giving you there, there is increasing in the farming industry the use of autonomous vehicles or slaved autonomous vehicles uh, within harvest to improve the, 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 the speed of harvesting, but also the precision of the harvesting, um, getting the maximum out of your fields, getting the maximum out of the, the resources you're putting into the fields, and the maximum out of the, the return from, the, from those resources. The efficiency, of course, could be at the expense of people. Okay? Efficiency might be defined as um, less people in, 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 in the process, less cost. Um, so, you know, again, if it, it comes with efficiency comes with some, bag some baggage. We may also be looking for extended functionality. Now, we are fortunate we will have a presentation about robots and autonomy in, in healthcare a bit later on in the session. Um, what I want to mention here is that we have some good news in the health service, okay? Increasingly, we have imaging in the operating room. So we have scanners in the operating room. Um, this allows real-time imaging uh, while a surgeon is operating. This means that some of the standard procedures we have today can be done with more surety, more, 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 um, more accuracy, and better outcomes. It also means, more good news, that some procedures that nobody had thought of before are now available to proceed to be done. The bad news is that some of these procedures that could be enabled by having real-time um, real imaging are beyond the speed or the dexterity of the surgeons to perform them. Like for certain cardiac um, uh, procedures that are potentially available with real-time um, uh, real imaging, the surgeon has a number of seconds to go in and do something in the vein and then come out. Okay? So the idea is that people are looking, are the ways of using robotics um, in that environment? Are they going to be autonomous, are they going to be periodically autonomous? So that means is there going to be a surgeon who will set the thing up and say, okay, I'm happy, go. 
um, uh, to a, what we call a periodic aut autonomy, but be under supervision of the surgeons. The idea being that we get extended functionality within that, within that environment. The one that I'm sure many people have heard about, and particularly relevant to a couple of the talks that are coming um, after, after myself, is safety in automotive. So the idea is that we're all hopeless at driving. Um, we're a risk to ourselves and our neighbours. The idea is that we can bring in at least assistance into the car, and eventually autonomous driving. So the idea is that the car will do, you'll say where you want to go, and the car will take responsibility for getting you to where you want to go in a manner which is safe and compatible with the rest of the, uh, of the, of the road users. The problem with that, of course, is that currently we have constrained physics and unconstrained agents, that's you and me, um, and we're going to inject um, these, these um, uh, autonomous driving systems into that environment. It's not sure that's going to work until we have 100% penetration of autonomous systems, if we ever get to that, to that point. We also have the possibility of using autonomous systems in the security world. Um, being a night watchman is a, 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 an environment which is uh, boring, uh, fraught with risk, um, and not a particularly great job. Having robots that can move around and fulfill that, jo fulfill that job means well, they don't fall asleep for a start. Um, they're not at risk of death if they get attacked by, by something. Um, and so it seems like a, a good environment in which to use robots and autonomous systems who are autonomously behaving in that environment. There are other motivations for autonomous systems as well. One motivation is that people love robots. We want to build robots. We're curious about the technology. We just, we've been brought up with it. We think we should have robots around us. Okay, that's just a, a motivation about inspiration. There are other darker motivations around autonomous systems notably removing what Graham Greene would have called the human factor in command lines. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with, some, with the certain events that happened in the first Iraq war, um, after that first Iraq war, the government suddenly had a serious concern about building more autonomy into the command lines and taking some of the human factors out of that environment. So there are some dark uh, uh, motivations for building autonomous systems. I will come back to some of that a bit later and some of the baggage that comes with these systems a bit later. Okay, so. Okay. We have a rough classification of autonomous systems. I don't say it's an absolute classification, it's a fuzzy classification as things move across these three, three elements. We have basically the kind of autonomous systems that people will probably think about, the directed program system that is going to fulfill a function as the programmer from a spec specified it was going to be done, and have we certified that it's going to fulfill this function in a manner which is safe and secure and always within um, error margins, etc. That is the kind of thing that we will see, I suspect, in current UAVs. Um, uh, that's uh, uh, the terminology we're using for actually drones, which I'm not, the word I'm not allowed to use from, uh, today. Um, trading systems, so we program trading systems a certain set of analytics um, which follow trends in the, in, in the market and then we'll respond to those trends in a very algorithmic, directed manner. Industrial robots, okay, so a painting robot. Uh, if you go into somewhere like Renault, PSA, you see the, most of the, the painting is now done by robots who take a car, comes in on the production line, they paint, and the thing goes out again. They are more or less autonomous. But we also have some, if you like, some curveballs coming into, the, into this domain. So systems that are emergent, Okay, there's an increasing amount of research going into systems that are programmed with micro-behavior okay, and a certain amount of interaction within that micro-behavior, coupled with some algorithms like flocking algorithms, um, swarming algorithms, which are, are algorithms developed particularly in the games industry, um, for, for, for having small micro-programmed um, objects give a function which have, comes out of the emergent activity of these things coordinated together. So this is the kind of um, the insect lab in the States where people are working on building insects, um, where they have micro swarms, um, where you, you get a function, which is the sum behavior of these small micro programmed little, little elements. And these in themselves become autonomous as well. Currently, they're looking at things like crop fertilization, so the idea is if, if the bee populations keep plummeting as they have been doing, will we have micro swarms that go out and, 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 and try to make an attempt at um, fertilizing uh, crops? Um, 
performance uh, art. We're now in cities, we will now more and more start seeing objects rolling down the street uh, and then converging in the, in the, in, in the city square, etc., as a performance uh, feature. Um, repair and survivability systems in, um, in various vehicles and things. So this is when we start looking to get to very small systems and eventually perhaps even nano swarms. Um, and increasingly, they're looking at things like swarms for energy harvesting. This is a, a more coordinated, more intelligent way of, att of attacking things like um, tidal power, wave power, um, thermal power, etc., by systems that are programmed within this environment as microelements to catch the, 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 the energy to very micro level. And of course, um, as uh, Simon Knoll uh, said yesterday in quite a very interesting talk, we're also going to see the development of systems that learn. This is the systems where we program a certain base behavior, and including in that base behavior is the capacity to reform their models of the world, to, to arrange themselves in the environment, and acquire more information about the environment and react to the environment um, based on some set of goals that have been programmed into them or perhaps goals that are transmitted to them on, on, on the fly. This, as was stated by Simon yesterday, um, is going to mean that we will stop programming systems and start teaching or training or coaching uh, systems. And so all the kinds of stories that come out of Isaac Asimov with the, the three laws of robotics, the psychology of robots, uh, etc., that has been so well documented in the science fiction arena, starts to look as if it might become uh, a reality for the future. We will see that kind of thing in things like geriatric care bots. Um, so, for instance, in, the, in Asia, for instance, there's been quite a big um, expense in research around robots caring for particularly um, elderly people. So these are robots that will have a certain amount of capacity to take medical measurements, a certain kind of capacity to ensure things like communication, to ensure things like um, eating properly, to ensure things like temperature stuff and things like that. These things are already being tested in, 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 in geriatric homes, etc., as autonomous robots which learn from the environment they're in how to react to the people they're dealing with in a, in a better, more comfortable manner. Okay. So what's the, our position on the current status? And here's where I might get myself shot. Um, there is currently some hype. Okay. Um, our view is, or at least my view, is that there's a lot of talk about autonomous driving. Autonomous driving is a great vehicle for doing research in advanced driver assistance, um, ensuring the safety of our, of our vehicles. Personally, I don't believe we're going to see autonomous vehicles for some time. Um, as I said earlier, the idea of in just injecting um, robots into an environment which is based on um, unconstrained agents, i.e. you and me, um, does not look um, very likely just given the sheer complexity of that environment. Just think of the way you drive down the street when you want to pull, into a, pull onto a, a road from the side road. You make calculations about the intent of the people around you. This is a very, very, very hard thing to do in programming or even in learning for the moment. I don't say it won't come at some point, but it, I don't believe it's going to come um, within the timescales that some people are advertising. The way we may mitigate that, of course, is that we adopt a restriction of the freedom uh, in, in the environment such that we have a very high penetration of robots on the road or driverless cars on the road with very, very strong policy-driven interactions in the same way as we have between aircraft, for instance, in the sky, where there are very formal policy rules about how aircraft interact with each other under various circumstances. That would be a way of mitigating some of those problems. We also have the controversy, of course, around um, uh, military UAVs, security UAVs, etc. I did mention that there were some other darker motivations in, in, in creating, the, creating UAVs. Uh, one is, again, removing human elements from a command chain. Basically, this is what UAVs and eventually autonomous UAVs are doing. Okay? So that's, you know, you might agree with it in certain circumstances, uh, but you'd better be sure about how that's going to be used in, in the future. There are also enormous opportunities and successful projects. Um, that is, uh, for instance, that's the Heathrow um, uh, autonomous um, train, I suppose you would call it, or tram. Um, there's agricultural systems already running with autonomous bins rec uh, recovering. Um, the harvest from the combined harvesters, etc. So they're very successful. 
And of course, enormous opportunities, which are real developments, notably robots for, uh, for space. NASA is currently investing an enormous amount of money about that. Space is fundamentally a hostile environment, particularly outside of the, of the craft. Robots would be extremely appropriate for that. And even doing things like managing loads in uh, like goods delivery, goods management, et cetera, within, um, within factories or within controlled environments. Now, my last slide, I just want to try and lay out a map of some of the challenges and the issues that we have to work with if we really want to go towards the longer-term highland vision of, of, of autonomous systems. One is energy, okay? We launch a system off it to be autonomous. How do we keep it um, going? It needs energy. Now, in certain environments, um, we can imagine robots that know when they're running on a charge. They can plug into a charger, um, and they can charge up a battery. But in some of the most useful autonomous environments where we want to do things like search and rescue, etc., we may be a long way away from um, energy. So there are some challenges around having autonomous systems that can, can sustain themselves in, in terms of energy. Complexity. The sheer complexity of decision-making um, that can be produced in, when you start to interact with the real world, with real physics, and with real um, goals and objectives just means that, you know, Currently, there are not computational models about how to deal with some of this stuff. We may get, we will get there eventually, but today, some of these challenges, even just some, some in certain cases, navigational challenges, uh, can, pr can produce what are basically intractable problems. Um, system development capability. Are we capable of, even when we get start getting the ideas of how to solve these complexity problems, of actually implementing those in systems in a robust, controlled manner, which is economically productive? Uh, safety and certification, we have um, some discussion coming about that in one of our talks, so I will pass over that. Uncertainty and probabilistic environments, okay, we, we don't have good models for dealing with uncertainty and probabilistic environments. Um, we either have models such as Bayes models, which require an immense amount of data in which to support the, the reasoning, or we have approximative metal, uh, models such as fuzzy reasoning or Dempster Schaefer algorithms, etc., where we don't have a grounded mathematical operational definition of what we're actually doing with the values that we're, that we're generating. So there are significant problems associated with that. Um, and then there's a couple of other things in the, what we might call the soft issues, which is the baggage that comes with these systems. Real economics. If we're talking about efficiency, I've already alluded to this, efficiency, does that mean just removing people from jobs? Now that might mean that for the company involved in doing this, there's a gain in efficiency but is that a local optimization that when we look at society as a whole, we've actually degraded our efficiency in the society, society as a whole? You know, I don't have a, an answer to that, and it'll be a case-by-case -case thing, but it's something that needs to be taken into account in what is a potentially an extremely economically disruptive um, form of technology. Uh, liability. Who's responsible when one of these uh, autonomous systems kills somebody? Okay, that's, you know, we all know that, that problem is lying out there, and and we're all trying to dancing around it, trying not to think too hard about it. But we're now coming to the point where we're getting sufficient um, maturity in some of the technologies, but we need to decide that this and need to measure on this. So, for instance, if I look at overtaking uh, assistance in cars, an overtaking assistant will only ever tell you when you can't overtake. It will never tell you when you can overtake, because that would be liability. Okay. Um, cost of ownership, who pays for um, whatever damage or whatever costs are associated in the ownership of these autonomous systems. Some of them are going to be very expensive. Okay, if they, for instance, if we go to a model where we're training objects, how often do they need to be trained? Do we have exams for robots that would have to maintain a certification of conformance for these robots? If we do, how do we run this? Who pays for this? Et and then a couple of things I'm going to throw into the curveballs here. Hidden undiscovered behavior. As these technologies get more sophisticated, as we allow for learning, et cetera, what side effects um, are we going to get out of these, these um, learnings, which we may not be expecting? They may end up being beneficial, they may end up being not. On a very trivial level, when people started working with neural networks, there was a particular kind of neural network called a Boltzmann machine, which is based on statistical mechanics. It was tuned by a parameter which was analogous to temperature. One of the first things they discovered in the laboratory was that when they disconnected the Boltzmann machine from external inputs, it started dreaming. It was going through the states it had learned in a random order. 
when we look at the analysis, it's obvious that that's exactly what it would do. But it was a very surprising, unexpected piece of behavior that this, that this, this system um, showed. That's completely benign. Perhaps with systems that start to be getting more sophisticated like that, we will get unexpected behavior that is less, behind, less benign uh, and more evident. And finally, we will still have to worry about morality. Again, this is a soft thing that people, we do. as technocrats, we tend to push that aside. Our belief is that autonomous systems offer an immense amount of opportunity for doing all sorts of very beneficial things. They also offer opportunities for, to be manipulated, to do things that perhaps we would not approve of necessarily. And they also offer a manner to manipulate people. We're going to have objects running around us, operating in the internet, um, within a manner which is autonomous, with, with policies and control theories and control ideas that we may, may be completely invisible to us and which are acting directly on us. This, is, this technology is truly, truly disruptive. Um, and as we start uh, bringing this more and more online, these issues cannot be danced around. We, we will have to face up to them and take our own positions as individuals on how we think about those, those, those activities. Okay, so that's my talk for this afternoon. Thank you very much. <laughs>